Welcome in, everybody, to the Flagship Podcast interview. I am very excited to welcome in to the Flagship Podcast the Athletic Director of the University of Texas, Chris Del Conte. People know him as CDC. You good with that nickname, CDC? It's fine. I've been called worse. <laughs> well, depends you know. on, the, uh, on the topic matter, but yes. When we were going through COVID, boy, CDC was tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. Uh, that might be a little, yeah, no, it's been uh, a, a nickname bit of uh, unfortunate uh, circumstance there. But yeah. um, CDC, I don't think everybody knows that you were a collegiate high jumper, and you finished your career uh, at UC Santa Barbara. You're a gaucho, so. Mm -hmm. How high? What was your highest high jump? I was actually a low jumper. Low jumper. A low jumper. It's funny. It's interesting. You look at that. Out of high school, I, I'm from Taos, New Mexico, and I went to Oregon State uh, um, for two years. And they dropped the track team. I uh, broke my arm my freshman year, my ankle my sophomore year. Um, just freak accidents. Uh, but they dropped the track team. And everyone at Oregon State always teases because they signed me. Uh, to go to Oregon State. <laughs> and I'm going to Santa Barbara. Uh, I had a great experience. Uh, you know, got back to about 6'10". It was, it was you know, great, great environment. I loved every bit of it. But how I got to, uh, to in this business as a house parent that was at the children's home I grew up in, uh, got me a job in the maintenance department at Washington State. And, you know, the rest is history. But uh, track and field was, it was an opportunity for me to get out of, get out of, get out of the situation I was in and get a scholarship and, and change my life and along the way. Many injuries that happened, but also uh, it was interesting when they dropped the track team at Oregon State. It was all about Title IX. And I really, this the first time I ever learned about, hey, we got to, this is the mid-80s, hey, they're dropping men's teams to add women's teams and going, what just happened here? Santa Barbara picked up my scholarship and had a great time at UCSB um, and then uh, spent another additional four years down there. So it's like six years of undergraduate degree before the COVID was COVID. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Beaverton, Oregon, where it rains like 200 days a year, or Santa Barbara, California. Uh, yeah, it was definitely shell shocked when I watched when I walked uh, people going to the campus with shorts on, no shirts, or or just bathing suits. You're like, what? Because it's right on the water. It's crazy. Oh, it's like the most beautiful campus I've ever seen. Yeah. Yes. Um, Okay, and true or false, you will be at the Journey concert at the Mood Wednesday night. You know, I would love to be at the Mood. The issue is I have a, a Houston event tonight and a Fort Worth event tomorrow night. I was going to go, but uh, my schedule got booked up, and uh, we're doing a, a Texas One Fund event in both cities. And uh, uh, when you're when you're on the docket to, to be there, you must be present. So unfortunately, I'm not, but... That Journey Escape uh, uh, album came out. My girlfriend in eighth grade, gave, seventh grade, gave me that for my Christmas present. So I have fond memories of Journey. Oh yeah, Journey Escape. <laughs> I've got Journey that, Escape. Uh, Every homecoming dance had a few of those tunes on there. Oh yeah, a little love and touch and squeezing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, okay. Well, you just led us into the uh, Texas One Fund then, and this is the new age we're in. Um, you can now uh, you know, market and campaign for the Texas One Fund, uh, which is a nonprofit collective. And you mentioned this in your town hall meeting. Uh, contributions are 100% tax deductible. How does this align, coincide with the, the Texas Longhorn Foundation, which is the fundraising arm of Texas Athletics? You have overseen the largest, uh, most expansive renovation in college athletics history over the last five years, uh, more than $750 million in facility renovation expansion. So how does that align priority wise for the athletic department? Well, and Chip, great question. I think a couple of things happen when you start to look about, it. I think the move to the Southeastern conference was critical. Uh, when you look three years ago, when president Trump, had said we're no, that, that he took away the athletic deduction. He did double your annual deduction from twelve thousand to twenty four thousand, but he took away your 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 ability to deduct priority seating. 
when that happened, I knew that the, the, the paradigm shift was changing, that our donors are going to now really not be no longer be able to write off that, that, that expense. So it became truly an entertainment spend. And we had spent a lot of money and, and time and money talking about creating an unbelievable fan experience. That when they come here, like kind of like Disney, that Disney's really expensive. But when you go to Disney, you're spending a whole day or two days there. You want your child to come back and say, that was awesome. It was worth my discretion or income. Similar to a football game now. When you can no longer write that off, that benefit is no longer there. You must figure out how you can go about it different. So four or five years ago, I saw it coming. I saw the law change. change. We got together. We said, okay. We're going to really revamp how we do game days. I think they've been fabulous. We're continuing to work with our, with our partners and lowering our concessions and trying to create an environment where our fans go, I'm going to go down to Austin, spend the day there, and it's worth my time and worth my discretionary income. Similarly, uh, uh, then, but now you go to the change conferences, and now who you play really matters. So that conference shift really was about who you play as well because once they took away the deduction, Playing Iowa State, playing Kansas State, playing TCU, Texas, those are great games. But all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute. Now you have a chance to play Alabama, Auburn, Georgia, Florida. Now the value of the current price is critical, and we can maintain that price. So that was really part of our thought process for this league change, and we knew that they were going to expand the playoff. It was just not if, it was when. That all being said, because that's all set, the Texas One Fund truly is an outside organization that has a 501c3 long form classification that they're going to give people opportunities to donate to the Texas One Fund. It's 100% tax deductible. They can then direct those funds to student athletes. What I love about this Texas One Fund is we're worried about the one and done. We're worried about the kid coming to Texas and leaving. Well, in order for them to receive funds from the Texas One Fund, they must perform duties within our community, whether it be Habitat for Humanity whether it be going back and looking at uh, our neighborhood long or working with Del, 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 uh, Children's Hospital. Anytime we can get our kids to go make an economic impact and a visual impact, both emotionally, they can now all of a sudden have a big tie to the University of Texas. That's why the Texas One Fund to me is really special. is because it's, it's, you're going to allow kids then to pour themselves into the community. We spent over 2,000 hours last year in the community, which is Really, really awesome because then our kids are not saying, you know what, Austin's where I want to be. I love this community. So I'm really proud of that. And then they have a chance to do what Bijan did, do, do it, uh, their own uh, uh, Bijan mustard or whatever else you guys cooking on the side. So it's it's been a new age, but uh, if we're going to get in the new age. We're going to dominate the new age. It's what we should do. Well, um, the move to the Southeastern Conference is now – Official, you're going to be going in 2024. Um, the all the, you know, the parameters of the departure from the Big 12, the 50 million dollars that Texas and Oklahoma will each pay um, through withheld uh, revenues. Um, but there's been some leaks that Texas's three um, permanent opponents would be Oklahoma, Arkansas, and A&M. Can you say anything about that? Are those leaks accurate? Well, I mean, I know you take on, uh, Chipper, the role of Columbo at all times. You're trying to figure things out. So I think you start the leak on purpose just to see what happens. Well, uh, this, this I firmly from... believe that you are the leak that then everyone just follows suit on by, by, by that. Historically, this has uh, uh, been the pattern. You'll know something, then you got to just leak it out there. I have no idea. But first and foremost, from the SEC for a moment, I'm just joshing you. I want to just a big shout out to Kevin Altai, our chairman of the board, and, and President Hartzell. Their leadership was critical throughout this time. Every time we talked about what the landscape was changing, where we were going, they were just on the forefront of, hey, we've got to make sure that, that Texas is always in the best position possible to be successful. And they were, they've been fantastic. And as I tell everyone, Everyone thinks that this this job, no decision of this magnitude is made in a vacuum. And you always want to have the, your leadership with you every single step of the way. And I'm just grateful for them because we come up with an idea and then they look at it a couple of different ways. We're able to reformulate a new idea and package it out there. So they were great and very instrumental in this move. Number two, um, we don't know what the, what the schedule is going to look like. Are we going to be an eight game or are we going to be a nine game? We do not know. We're going to go to a 12-game playoff. I think what you have to look at is the ultimate goal is to get as many teams as you can in that 12-team playoff, right? 
So the more teams you get in the 12th, then you get a chance to win a national championship. So does that eight games? I believe the Big Ten is going to go to nine games. The Pac-12 is going to go to nine games. The Big 12 is going to go to nine games. So it looks at it and says, wait a minute, does nine games work? I look at it prefer nine games because we play an odd situation with OU on, uh, on a neutral site. So I'd like to have four home games, four road games, and, and then always have that OU game on neutral site. If you don't have a, a neutral site game, you get a 5-4 mix every other year. But I prefer – I don't want to go 4-3. So if it was going to ask me, because football is the economic engine that makes everything run, I would prefer four games on the road, four at home, and then that neutral site game. So, uh, and it's easier to plan for. But, but again, they're not asking me today. So we have our first meeting. I've been going to meetings, but, you know, it's hard to go to meetings when you haven't exactly, uh, uh, you're not at the seat of the table yet. But, you know, we got invited to the seat of the table. We're no longer in the back row. We're ready to rock and roll. So, We'll, we'll, we'll have a great discussion. And the, the league has been fantastic. Commissioner Sankey is second to none. His leadership is unbelievable. And I love the ADs in the room. So we'll look forward to those discussions. But nothing's been set on the leaks that you've uh, leaked out earlier. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I appreciate <laughs> your uh, your answering that that question. We'll take a answering quick break. your own leak. Chipper, answering your own leak. I, I saw it on a tweet from a guy <laughs> named Kyle Umlang. So, oh, Kyle. I love my, you can't throw Kyle. That dude is a solid longhorn, by the way. Oh. Hey, some of the stuff that dude comes up with, it just cracks me up. He just re rips everyone's ass on Thursdays. I don't know if we can say that on this on this podcast, but every Thursday, he's laying wood on somebody. It's comedy. Oh, my God. He gets you through a day. When I'm, when I'm down in the dumper, I look at some of his stuff and go, that's just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a quick break here on the flagship podcast with Texas Athletic Director Chris Del Conte. And if you're watching us on the Horns 24 7 YouTube channel, we will roll on. And um, CDC, obviously, um, I know there's been questions about what's going to happen to the Longhorn Network once you move into the Southeastern Conference. And based on what you said on the town hall meeting on, uh, on Monday night, it sounds like um, games, you know, the volleyball games, softball games, baseball games that people have come to love on LHN will be probably on the ESPN plus platform. Once you go to the SEC network. I think they're going to be on the SEC network and ESPN plus and ESPN. They have a, a complete pre- a plethora of channels that you can be on. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. We have, and kudos to Delos and CP. Both of them did an amazing job creating the Longhorn Channel for us. And, and that's just 175 live events. As I currently look at it right now, where our goal is to put all 175 events on, on the platform. Alabama is probably doing the most right now, about 125. So we're going to look at how we do that every day because what ends up, we have to produce those events and move and, and put them on the platform because we're used to that. We believe we'll, we'll be able to do that. I'm not going. I think we'll ease our the first year in. We got to come back and build the studio right now. So we're in the process of identifying this place to put built that studio. But it's about a 20 million dollar project to build that entire studio out, and then hire the talent because we will produce and put all the games on ourselves, and then they'll just provide us that platform. So it's really exciting for the college, uh, the Moody College of Communication, because we get the young kids involved. They can sit there get real world experience. The good thing is we have Longhorn Network and a lot of its staff there that can roll over. So I am excited for that opportunity. LHN, well, then we're looking at a way that we can – we own all that content. So we want to make sure how do we do that contact and maybe look at putting it on YouTube. We still can do coaches' shows. We do a lot of things uh, uh, with with, uh, with our friends at, at, uh, at Learfield. So those are those are coming down the pike. Um, but we will we will make sure that all of our, uh, all of our games are on television or streaming. Well – I know uh, Longhorn football fans and season ticket holders um, are excited at uh, some of the news that you brought forth uh, during the town hall meeting. You said that probably in the next two to three months, you'll have uh, plans that you can announce for an indoor football practice facility. Uh, You said new LED lighting will be in DKR for this upcoming season, the 2023 season? Yeah, so I think a couple of things. One is, is not only trying to find the proper site. Because where our practice fields are located, I know Mac Brown was really aggravated that we didn't put the practice fields where the track is. 
because right now when you the way school is set up and the way classes are set up, it, it takes out about 40 minutes of your day. And you think, yeah, it's only 40 minutes. It's a lot when you think about going, trying to get kids to all be, in the, be, be there by one o'clock, get dressed, get taped. There's a, there's a huge scheduling conflict that's always happened. And when you got to walk the additional 40 minutes to get ready to go to practice, it's a problem. And we're taking buses to and from. So what, really, what I'm really what I'd like to do is get our practice facility just right next to DKR. That if we could do that and, and find the ways that make the most sense, then you can have practice. But it may or may not. Then we, if we're going to have to go where our current location is, how does that look like? So what does that look like as well? Putting the indoor, the, just the structure and building maybe a little bit more infrastructure up there that when we're there, we're there. And we're not going back and forth. So uh, we believe we have uh, uh, President Hartzell has uh, has been steadfast. Every single every single conversation we've had is to make sure we put ourselves in the very best position to be successful. This is one of those those opportunities. But we just have some I, I owe him and, and the Board of Regents four or five different plans for them to look at. Once they do that, and they, they say this is the one that makes the most sense. Steve anoints the one he wants. Then we will uh, pass the basket around the pews and see how much we can collect. So the uh, the LED lighting <clears throat> inside the stadium yeah. for this season, yes, um, you know, paint that picture for for the folks. What what you said you're going to be able to do multicolored lights, go to blackout because right now if you went to blackout, it would take what 15 minutes for the lights to come back on. Those are all those old boys school. Remember back in the gymnasium, back in the they would just you hear this noise forever. They finally turned sizzle. on. Yeah. This is what you got cooking in DKR. Those 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 lights are really really old, and and, and the infrastructure is really old. So replacing the lighting. But you look at what we did at Moody, create a really cool home field advantage for Moody and have a different, just a different uh, entertainment value. I, I know others other schools have started doing that a couple of years ago. I liked it, but we'll do our own twist to it. But the reality of doing this is, LED lighting for us is the new infrastructure lighting. We need to just upgrade our lighting system across uh, across the board. And you know. For a while there, because the way the lighting is set up, you can't pop popcorn upstairs. We have to pop popcorn at Irwin Center on Wednesday to bring it up because all the breakers are work, go off up, upstairs because it's such an archaic system. So that system was built in 1968. The concessions can't handle it, that we had to pop popcorn in Irwin and bring it over on Wednesday. Think through that. So when people are blowing me up about stale popcorn, I'm like, you ain't lying. But there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> so redoing the infrastructure, the, the lighting just happens to be uh, um, a byproduct of that. The most important thing is that we're going to be able to then have all new fresh offerings up there, redo our concessions, redo our uh, infrastructure, that we create better fan experience. In the meantime, we get to do new lighting. That's just a, a, a cherry on top. Well, and you mentioned that when – I should have mentioned this when you – uh, talked about the indoor practice facility. You said when the indoor practice facility uh, finally comes online, I would imagine in probably at least two years from now that DKR uh, would go to a grass field again. Yeah. Uh, that- and it's funny. Yeah. We, we, we all, I would love to go to grass. Everyone does. But the problem with the current situation is where the weight room is located. And the, once you put grass on, you can never go on it. It's like you, you it's, a, it's, it's a rarity you get on. You got to keep that thing as pristine as it is. And you're going to put 120 big behemoths out there running back and forth. You can really create a problem. And then the band comes out there and practice. You cannot do it that way. So once you go to grass, you got to have alternative places for them to play and alternative places for them to practice. So it's not as just simple as put grass and then say, okay, here you go. It's not that easy because the way we're currently set up, the band uses that facility. The band stands and practices, and when they stand, they just stand in one spot. You know, you can just kill the whole the whole opportunity. When I was at TCU, we probably used the field outside of games maybe a dozen times throughout the whole year. It's crazy, you know what I mean? Because you know those big those big old dudes just motored up and down the field. So right. you know, so it's not outside of the six Saturdays a year. Then we'd have Friday practice. We never were in the stadium ever. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so that's so you have to look at that thought for a moment, and then do you have adequate practice facilities for them to use? So, once we address a practice facility and the place for our band, we're in really good shape, and we will go to grass immediately. Well, one of one of the uh, I think favorite responses from the town hall meeting 
uh, was about whether Texas would ever have an alternate uniform uh, in football. And you said, if God wanted sunsets to be purple and green and red and, you know, he, he would have done that, but they're burn orange. Sunrises are burn orange. It's perfect. Um, so I love that. Did you just come up with that on the fly or is that something that you woke up that morning? Well, yeah. Woke up. No, we've been talking about it a little bit here all the time because there's been always Elizabeth who, uh, who, uh, who I get to work with. It was now Liz and Quero. She'll send me a picture of a sunrise or a sunset because back in the day I always said, you know what? The one thing, the first thing God sees when he wakes up is burn orange. The last thing he sees when he goes to sleep is burn orange. We got it right. Don't let's don't mess with perfection. So that's normally what I say uh, uh, when you think about it, right? When, when, when so, and then she started sending me pictures all the time from Quero. Look at this sunset. It's it's pretty comedy. So then, but last night I kind of jumbled it a little bit. But if you look at it, we just so then people are blowing me up on social media. But it's just the idea of guys. We are the University of Texas. Why are we this idea of embracing an alternative uniform? Why don't we embrace what's truly unique to us? It's our color. Mike Perrin is the old AD here. He goes, boy, the controversy if it's not the same burn orange. He brought me his jersey from 68. It's the same color of our team right now. I have them side by side. So anyone that wants to disagree with it, they can come in and say, I got the 67, 68 jersey next to our current jersey. The one jersey that was darker, though, was the tearaway jersey from, from back in the day with Ricky Williams. And it was that crazy because we were Reebok. So the top was light. Well, the top was the right color, but the mesh, when it got dark, when it got sweaty, became darker. But it's but of all of our uniforms, we're, we're almost right when you look at the Daryl Royal era, and I have them in my office. But that Ricky Williams, that era with the, with the Reebok uniform, definitely was darker. Um, but but uh, uh, that's where everyone kind of gets a little bit uh, uh, tweaked out about. But I, I, I like the color. I love our logo. I love everything about what it means to be a Longhorn. We just got to embrace those traditions. Every time I meet with a kid, I go, you watch Oregon play. Do you know it's Oregon? Right. You don't. You go watch, you know, you watch. That's not their color. I understood when I was at TCU why we had multiple uniforms. They, didn't, they had to re reinvent their identity. They were trying to do something that attracts student athletes. They, and, and, and they were going through all those cycles. And I embraced them and did them all. I loved it. But when you're here and an unbelievable blue blood, you don't change. You embrace. I like it. I like it. Um, okay, so Rodney Terry and this Texas basketball team, hmm. none of these players asked for this. Chris Beard, you know, getting dismissed. Uh, they're, here they are you know, with four games left and they are right there tied atop um, the big 12 standings. What does, what does Rodney Terry need to do um, to remain the coach of Texas basketball? Well, I don't think Rodney Terry needs to do anything. I think you start to look back for a moment, how this, how this coaching staff was constructed and how this team was constructed. And you just got to give a lot of credit to coach Beard and, and what transpired is sad for everybody. And I, I, I feel bad for him. I feel bad for his fiance. I just feel bad for Texas, but I feel bad for him and his family. He had three daughters, just everybody involved. Tr truly a sad, 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 sad time. But moving forward, we made a decision to move forward and how we had to do that. We're currently moving forward, but how you got to give credit, how that staff was constructed. There's four coaches on that staff or four former head coaches former head coaches. So when he brought Augie, he brought Rodney, he brought Bob, and he brought uh, Shooter, you know, uh, from from Wyoming on, on the staff. You start to look at that team. There are four, four former head coaches on that staff. They have a really, really old team. Four guys on that team are 24 years old. So we have one guy turning 25 here pretty quick. That's an old team. They've been through it. So – we're really proud of, of what, what Rodney's done and all those coaches have done because they've maintained the plan, maintained the plan. And as I told Rodney and the coaching staff, guys, hey, you got the whistle. Let's go. But we will address that, that the, the moving forward, but we will not have that discussion today, nor will I. As you know, Chip, I never have a, a coaching search that's public because you can't have a public coaching search here. When the time is right and, and we make that decision, uh, uh, we'll do whatever what's sort of the best interest of our student athletes, our, our university, and and, uh, and the and Texas. Period. But 
really proud of Rodney, proud of what he's doing, excited for him, excited for everybody. But that's a constructed team that was that came in with a purpose. And because it's an older team, they're able to weather the storm than a really young 18-year-old team, I believe, would really have struggled. Um, Steve Sarkeesian, this football program, the momentum um, that they've maintained in recruiting, bringing in Gary Patterson as a special assistant. Uh, sounds like maybe Sarkeesian will add a special assistant on offense. Um, you know, expectations are going up for this Texas football program. A lot of people are asking me, is it a Big 12 title season or bust for Texas? Your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think when you look at it, and I, and I had this conversation earlier, and you can probably go do the math at one time. We played Kansas a couple of years ago when we lost. Boy, it was just crazy. But I believe we had 54 guys on scholarship that game. We had gotten, you know, so we had this whole idea when I hired, when we hired Steve, the one thing he looked at goes, man, we're constructed really weird. Not blaming anybody, but we're constructed weird. We have 18 wide receivers. We have eight offensive linemen. We haven't had an offensive lineman draft in the first round since 08. Within the kid ended up going, uh, Connor ended up going to the Cowboys. So uh, because just look through how we're constructed, it makes no sense. No defensive lineman. So part of when we were looking at uh, uh, that hire was we had a foresight of where we were going. We knew where we were going. We need someone to say, "Hey, <coughs> excuse me, here's how how a, how a Southeastern Conference team is constructed." We knew that. We wanted to have someone that brought that fresh, that breath fresh of air to us. But at the end of the day, that first year we had a lot of, a lot of false hopes to a, a big doom last, and we were getting bad field positions. You were just everyone's going, "What is happening?" Well, you dissect every single game; you can always find reasons why. But at Texas, there's no excuses. But I, I looked at how we were constructed. I see what he went through that first year. Saw last year, our average starting age is 19.2. Conversely, TCU's is 23 point nine really old team. We're a really, really young team. We're going to be a really young team next year too, but we're going to have a lot of talent. It's going to be exciting to watch. And, and, I, and I look at that and go, all the, all the, all, all the block, the building blocks are in place. We're massively up front offensive line. We got some dudes in the defensive line, had to eat key pieces in the secondary. So, and, and they're really good youth and the wide receivers. And we got two great quarterbacks, three great quarterbacks. The quarterback room is going to be highly competitive. So, I do think that uh, our expectations every year at the University of Texas are always uh, boom or bust. You know what I mean? And uh, I get it. That's just what, why you come here, why you're here. You got any players to watch? Any any guys you're, you know? Um, you know, I, 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 I just – I always like to watch a quarterback's maturation from year to next. I remember when I was at Washington State, I remember watching Drew Bledsoe go from what he was till he was a junior. I remember watching Ryan Lee do, do what he did. Uh, uh quarterback that quarterback position as they get older remember Ewers only played five games his junior year five and he got hurt had that sports hernia played the playoff game but he was really banged up then he left went right to Ohio State and he didn't get to play his whole senior year and the following year so his real live action was first time was last year so you can see some games glimpses where he was on and others man it was whoo, the speed of the game a quarterback as you get a little older the game slows down and you get to see it differently. So I'm excited to see what he he does this year because I just think that uh, he's special talent. Um, everyone loves, obviously, at the University of Texas, the backup quarterback is the greatest position in America. So it's like the Dallas Cowboys. you know. But I did, I, I think his maturation will be great. I think the defensive line, uh, those will be our strength. Uh, Choke did an amazing job with the linebackers. We've got a young, young crew coming in. And we got a lot of good young wide receivers. I mean, there's talent um, everywhere. There's talent everywhere. It's just be yeah. how they gel. Yeah. We'll let you go on this, CDC. Red McCombs, bigger than life, uh, passed away Monday at the age of 95. Um, I mean, everyone who's ever met Red McCombs has a Red McCombs story, of course. He was not shy on opinions, but <laughs> what a life this, uh, this Texas legend led. Oh, and, and not only the University of Texas, but a state of Texas. He's one of the old great raconteurs. You know, he just had a story for everything. He lived this life that was just phenomenal. I mean, it's every kid's dream 
to own, you know, several started out owning like a, a, a minor league baseball team. And then, you know, then bought the, bought the Spurs and the, the, the Nuggets had a little interest in Houston, bought a pro team, all those things that you could ever wonder as a young boy doing, he accomplished. But he always loved the state of Texas, and he always loved San Antonio, and he loved the University of Texas. But he's one of those old guys that uh, they're far few and in between because his opinion today would be would always be different because of social media, the way he lived his life, the character that he was. Like I said, when I first went to see him, we talked about a variety of things. He gave me his opinion and everything else. Goes, we're talking about because you got a coach. I go. Mr. McCombs, I love our coach. He's doing a hell of a job. You always got to have a backup. You just never know when, son. And then I got three backups for you. And I'm thinking to myself, what are we talking about? It was just comedy. You gave me three names. I walked out of the door. I go, I came back and he's right. You know what I mean? But always, and I always have names you look at along the way. You know, hey, we can be careful about a flash in the pan. Who's the right fit? How? And What's their breadth of history? You know, when you're hiring someone at the University of Texas, there has to be a long breadth of history. It can't be a one or two uh, flash in the pan years because this is, if you look at the old adage from the Bible, David and Goliath, and we talk about this all the time, you got to embrace Goliath. That's who we are. You have to embrace who the University of Texas is. It's like this massive, massive aircraft carrier. When you want to turn right or left, it's not that easy. When you're in a PT boat, it's easy. So when you take someone from a PT boat cruise and you put him here, it just is so much different. So when you hire someone, this is Red always telling me, make sure they understand the gravitas of the University of Texas. They have to understand the gravitas. So he was really vocal about hires or vocal about things because he knew they couldn't understand what it meant when you put it on that burn orange and white. Yeah. And that was always his advice to me. But but I go back and started reading all these clips from from yesteryear. Any kind of things that he was chirping about was really not about the person himself. Is that is that person ready to lead our great institution? Yeah. Well, I I I mean, he was something special, um, no doubt about it. He, Joe Jamail, these bigger than life icons uh, who've been affiliated with. You know, with Texas through their love, the Longhorns, of course, McCombs name is on everything. McCombs School of Business, McCombs uh, Softball Stadium. Um, but CDC, is there anything else that you think is important for for fans, for those watching and listening to to know that that I left out? No, but I, I just be remiss. You know, we had we had we lost uh, Joe Jamel. We ended up losing Mr. Moncrief and and Red McCombs. Those are three iconic figures that uh, the lost odds is 85 years old. I'm talking to the lost yesterday about what the impact they had on the University of Texas. And they had a little huge impact. But who's next? Who is the next Red McCombs? Who's going to be the next Joe Jamel? Who's going to be the next Tex Moncrief? Because this institution needs them. They need them. For a long time, they're ca- they, they cast this massive shadow. And now they're gone. And, and God rest their souls, but we need the next persons to step up and say, we got the mantle. We're going to continue to take it on. So uh, I can't wait to see that unfold. Um, I think we're, I know the leadership from the governor to the chairman of the board, to the president has never been more aligned in, in, in a long, long time. So we have everything set up in motion for us to, 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 to really have this decade be our decade. And the last 10 years have been a wandering decade a little bit in terms of how we actually how we started the decade in the, in the early 09, 10, 11, 12. It's just a real tough time. But for us to go back to the Southeastern Conference in terms of who we're playing, rivalries, and get ourselves in a really good position, uh, couldn't be happy with where we're headed. So I appreciate you, you Chip. And uh, more importantly, I appreciate you uh, always having a leak or two out there for me to go chase. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we appreciate you listening into this conversation with Texas Athletic Director Chris Del Conte. For CDC, I am Chip Brown. Until next time, we'll see you over at Horns247.com. Stay safe and keep the faith.